That the Christian worldview and the Bible will promote one man to one woman and together raising their children under one roof as best as possible. There are too many children in this country who have no father, have their mother's last name because the father is a married man or the mother don't know the father's last name. Nobody knows where him there. How are we doing today? God bless you. Happy Sunday and happy Father's Day to all the fathers and grandfathers and godfathers and fathers who are dreaming about being fathers. Happy Father's Day. You know, some time ago I was at the uh, tax office and there was this elderly lady who was there for, for what could have been, she must have been there for hours because I was there for at least an hour and I came there and saw her and she was just talking and preaching very motherly and as the young men walked out of the establishment she would stop them and say lift up your hands and she lay her hands on, on, on them chest and say I'm going to pray for you and it was just amazing to me that none of the young men resisted her. They knew her. They didn't know her. And, but she was so motherly in her approach. And, and they willingly accepted prayer and blessings from this woman. And then she stood in front of the long line. We were under the tent. And she said, when, this is from last month, you know, May. And she said, when Father's Day come, for all of you who are good father and who daddy and who take care of your pitney, you who have a good day, happy Father's Day. But for the rest of you who are not doing supposed to do, have a rough day. Yeah. <laughs> oh my. That woman, whoa, she left, she left a mark. She left a mark. She left a mark. I didn't meet her, but I listened to her keenly. The word of the Lord comes to us this morning from 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel, not 1 Samuel's now, it's just Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 2. And I want you to stick with me because I will be reading from verse 12 through to verse 34, which is the majority of the chapter. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there and I will be reading from the new international version. First Samuel 2, verse 12. Eli's sons were scoundrels. Mm -mm -mm. Mm -mm -mm. Could easily replace that word with mongrels. Eli's sons were scoundrels. They had no regard for the Lord. Now it was the practice of the priests that whenever any of the people offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged fork in his hand while the meat was being boiled and would plunge the fork into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. Whatever the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is how they treated all the Israelites who came to Shiloh. But even before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the person who was sacrificing, Give the priest some meat to roast. He won't accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. If the person said to him, let the fat be burned first and then take whatever you want, the servant would answer, no, hand it over now. If you don't, I'll take it by force. So people are coming to worship the Lord, right? And when they were busy trying to do their sacrifice and do it the right way, there were these servants of the priests who would come and threaten them with violence. 
if they didn't do it the way that they were saying, which is the wrong way. And I'll get into that later on. So verse 17. This sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. But Samuel, contrast, Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. Each year, his mother made him a little robe and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife, saying, May the Lord give you children by this woman to take the place of the one she prayed for and gave to the Lord. Then they would go home. All right, look at me just for a little bit, just to give you a backdrop. So this is a situation where Elkanah, this man, he had two wives, one of whom was Hannah. Now, the other wife, whatever her name is, because she's not important right now, she had a lot of children by this man, Elkanah. And the situation is that, you know, she started to taunt poor Hannah, a bay, you know, Hannah Pitney, a me one, and, and she was just sad for, for a long time. And, you know, Elkanah was there trying to comfort the wife that he loved. And he would say, am I not more important to you than ten sons? It's all right. Come on now, honey bunch. I love you so much. But I know that in her heart, I I can't imagine she was saying, you can't go and chat, you know, because your father already, I mean, no mother, I mean, I got through disgrace in you know, this place here yeah, because I don't have any children. For the Lord had not yet opened her womb. So there it is. She went to the temple out of desperation, frustration, and can't take it no more. Sometimes hardship in our lives, they are important because they drive us to the altar. So she went to the temple. She went to the altar of God and she was in agony, praying to God and just praying to God. Her lips were moving, says the scriptures, but no words came out. And priest, Mr. Priest, Mr. Priest, Eli saw her and undiscerning as he was, the Bible says that he thought she was drunk. Him don't ask the lady any question. Him said, then how you drink so? Where you do at the altar and look so? And she said, no, please don't think that I am treating the Lord's offering with contempt or anything. I'm just here crying out because I don't have any children and I want. And him said, all right. And he blessed her. She went home and Elkanah made love to her, she became pregnant with a promised child. She said to the Lord, if you give me this child, I'm going to give him back to you. And of course, the Lord answered her prayer. She, she honored her promise to the Lord. So when she weaned the little boy, Samuel, she brought him to Eli to be mentored in the ways of the temple. And so he was growing up in the temple. So once a year at the annual sacrifice, they came back to visit. So she still only had that one son. So when she came back to visit to give him his little, you know, ephod and so on, which is a priestly garment because that's what he was being trained to do. Here it is that uh, Eli would then pray and bless them again. So now we are at verse 21. And the Lord was gracious to Hannah. She gave birth to three sons and two daughters. What a God, eh? How nice. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Now Eli, who was very old, heard about everything his sons were doing. To all Israel and how they slept with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Now in this 21st century, that's like sleeping with the ushers at the door. Um, male to female, nothing else. Fire. For all of that, which is sin. Now, he said to them, verse 23, why? Why do you do such things? I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. No, 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 my sons. 
The report I hear spreading among the Lord's people is not good. Now, Eli seems to have been forced into saying something to his sons. Because now people are talking, news are spread. He is the high priest at Shiloh and his sons are supposed to be priests, but they are wayward. Verse 25, if one person sins against another, God may mediate for the offender. But if anyone sins against the Lord, who will intercede for them? His sons, however, did not listen to their father's rebuke, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. I'll explain that shortly. And the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with people. This is the exact thing that was said about Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Verse 27. Now a man came, a man of God came to Eli and said to him, Now you know this is very bad. When a man of God has to come with a word from the Lord to the priest who was supposed to be hearing from God. A man of God came to Eli and said to him, this is what the Lord says. Did I not clearly reveal myself to your ancestors' family when they were in Egypt under Pharaoh? I chose your ancestor out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest to go up to my altar, to burn incense, and to wear an ephod in my presence. I also gave your ancestors' family all the food offerings presented by the Israelites. Why do you scorn my sacrifice and, offer that I and, and offering that I prescribed for my dwelling? Why do you honor your sons more than me by fattening yourselves on the choice parts of every offering made by my people Israel. Therefore, the Lord God of Israel declares, I promised that members of your family would minister before me forever. But now the Lord declares, and this is one instance where the Lord reverses a promise that he made. Because you see, sometimes people take God for puppy show, you know, and think that, uh, you know, God made a promise so you can do whatever you want and don't honor God and just cut and go through because it's coming to you anyway. Well, be careful. Be careful because God is a holy God and his expectations of us will not change. So here it is that the scripture says, but now the Lord declares, far be it from me. Those who honor me, I will honor. But those who despise me will be disdained. The time is coming when I will cut short your strength and the strength of your priestly house so that no one in it will reach old age. This is judgment now on Eli's, Eli's house. No one will, will reach old age and you will see distress in my dwelling. Although good will be done to Israel, no one in your family line will ever reach old age. Every one of you that I do not cut off from serving at my altar, I will spare only to destroy your sight and sap your strength. And all your descendants will die in the prime of life. Mm -mm. Final verse 34. And what happens to your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas? will be assigned to you. They will both die on the same day. This is the word of the Lord. We honor it by saying, thanks be to God. The message outlined today is simply this. We're going to talk a little bit about Eli and unearth some lessons that we can learn from Eli. And I will leave you with some questions 
to ponder. Now, as I reflected and prayed about this particular message, I really had fathers in mind. But I want to make it clear that uh, this really applies to parents. And uh, I invite us to listen keenly, not just to what I am about to say, but to tune into the Holy Spirit and allow him to, to, to feed you with uh, what he wants to say to you specifically. The late Billy Graham, he opined, and I quote, a good father is one of the most unsung, unpraised, unnoticed, and yet one of the most valuable assets in our society. Some men are great fathers. Some men are just great fathers. And today, I want to say to you great fathers who are listening to me today, whether online or in the sanctuary or in the churchyard, it is my hope that your love, your provision, your presence, and your efforts will be acknowledged and appreciated. Happy Father's Day again. Now, in the text today, we are introduced to a few men. There was Eli, who was the priest. There's Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli. And then there was Samuel, who was a priest in training. And of course, we heard about Elkanah, Samuel's father, and an unnamed man of God who communicated God's message to Eli at the opportune time. Now let's talk about Eli. Eli was a priest, a high priest in Shiloh. And he was also a judge in Israel. He was a faithful servant of the Lord for 40 years. He had two sons named Hophni and Phinehas. And in addition, he took the boy Samuel, who was the son of Elkanah and Hannah, when he was still a little boy and taught him in the ways of the temple. Eli was a respected and respectable man. He did very well in serving his community. So far, Eli looks good. He has a great profile. But Eli has one weakness, and I say weakness in quotes. He failed to do what he must do as a father in his own home. Now, let's look at Eli's sons for a little bit. The Bible says that these young men were scoundrels. That means they were wicked men, and in Hebrew, this means literally sons of worthlessness. So these were just worthless young men. The expression is commonly used to denote morally corrupt individuals. So they had absolutely no moral standing whatsoever. And they had no regard for the Lord. When the Bible says they had no regard for the Lord, another version says that they had no respect for God, it literally means in the Hebrew that they did not know God. So here it is that Eli appointed his sons who didn't know God to take over some of the responsibilities of the priesthood. And of course, they were not operating in the expectations of being a priest. So here we have a father who is a priest and doing well in his quote-unquote job, taking care of his assignments, but his sons are wayward. These young men, Hophni and Phinehas, they took advantage of the, the, the position, their position as sons of Eli, and they did not conduct themselves in a way that pleased the Lord. They treated the meat offered in sacrifice to the Lord with contempt and did evil 
by participating in sexual immorality. They slept with the women who served at the entrance of the tabernacle. Now here's an alarming fact. Eli knew about their wickedness and he rebuked them for their wrong deeds but they just did not listen to their father in the same way that they did not show any obedience to God. And I want you to catch this and catch it good. Eli rebuked his sons, but he failed to restrain them. He rebuked his sons, but he failed to restrain them. Listen to 1 Samuel 3, chapter 3, verse 13. It says, for I told him that I would judge his family. This is God speaking to Samuel. When Samuel just now got his call and God gave him a word, his first word to give to Eli. He says, for I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God or in the Hebrew, they made themselves contemptible to God and he failed to restrain them. And this now takes me, I'm going to share about five lessons with us from this story of Eli. Now, whenever we're talking to a group of people, whether we want to say, if we're, if we're talking to fathers, it's very difficult to leave out the mothers because you'll be accused of being imbalanced, you know? And if you're talking to the mothers, it's very difficult to leave out the fathers because, again, people go and say, boy, you know, it's, is it two of them kind of thing? And in some cases, there are some people who will even blame the child. A poor little pitney. Hello, brother Misha, I like your shirt. Happy Father's Day. I see you celebrating in fine style. Amen. Now, here it is. Recently, I had a situation that I was pulled into. Because there are some women who make it very hard for the fathers. Because of their own issues that they have personally or maybe with the father. And they, they, they pretty much sacrifice the children in order to spite or hurt the father. Look here now, ladies. None of that in Jesus' name. None of that. If you care about your children any at all, just act in the way that is pleasing to God all the time and in the best interest of all the persons involved. Don't be wicked and vindictive and, you know, and, and behave in ways that will eventually hurt your own children and even the fathers. You know, uh, the, the, to, to hear a woman who all her children is for the same man tell the children, and they're all living under one roof, you know, because of whatever conflict they're having. Tell the children in front of the father that he doesn't love them because he's trying to correct them. You know, I mean, that, that is just sheer wrong. It's just wickedness. You know, it's, it's just wickedness and, 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 and all of that. So don't, don't triangulate the children at all, ladies. Get it together. And by the way, the title of this message is Get Your House in Order. Get Your House in Order. And I recognize that for some fathers, getting your house in order is a challenge because you don't have one house. And you know, I, 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 years ago, I was in an office and was pulled into a conversation, and I always get pulled into conversations, especially when I see an opportunity to share the gospel. I like to just be present, and then when me hear my name call me, he dead eh? And I was pulled into this conversation, a young man who had not yet started having children. For some reason, we were talking about, you know, fatherhood and having children and so on, and this young man who could have been about 21 years old, he says that he wants to have at least 14 children. So we were shocked and in awe because this man is not even in a proper job. 
to be talking about 14 children. So we ask him the question. So how are you planning to take care of all of them? Is one woman you're going to have so many children with? You're planning to get married? That was my question. You're planning to get married? And he, he said to me, no, sir. Not different, different woman. And just leave them. Leave a bit in them. And I was baffled. To think that this is the kind of thinking that a young man would have. And the sad reality is that in Jamaica, it's not only young men like him. There are people who we would consider big, respectable men too, who have the same kind of mentality. Fathers, if you're going to have children, you must know where they are and you must play your part in their lives. Now, if it is that you have made some mistakes, you're in church this morning and let me say that the Christian worldview and the Bible will promote one man to one woman and together raising their children under one roof as best as possible. All right? Now, going outside of your family home to have another family and have another family here, there, and everywhere, you are only hurting the children. There are too many children in this country who have no father, have their mother's last name because the father is a married man or the mother don't know the father's last name. Nobody knows where him there. Some people thief money and run away and all kinds of crosses. We all need to do better in the interest of family and children and the Jamaican society. We need to do better. So when I say get your house in order, because this is a phrase that has been used in the scriptures, and I want to point out that getting your house in order is not limited to the physical three-bedroom house that you're living in. It is every person connected to you, wherever they are. And in biblical days, it referred to all of your servants, all of your grandchildren, and everybody in the extended family, the immediate immediate family and everybody get your house in order when the Bible says when it was Joshua who said as for me and my house it was not just he and his wife and his children it was everybody in the house so get your house in order it means that as fathers and mothers too we need to step up to the plate and play our God-given role in order that I mean let us really think about this just think about what we have been seeing in the news lately. Think about the number of children who are now getting involved in violent behaviors in schools. I don't know about you, but the first question that comes to my mind usually is, so, so where is their father there? So where their mother there? When a child is going to, a child is on suspension from school, clearly, because people don't just get suspension, so, so, so. You're on suspension because you are violated and violated in a real way. And a child who is on suspension from school gets up, puts on his uniform, and comes into the institution to sell weed. And then when he is restrained, he decides that he's going to beat up the teacher. Where is the mother and where is the father? He got up and left his house suspended and has on uniform and goes to school to make mischief. Where are the parents? So we have to get our house in order, fix the family and fix the society. We must get it together, people of God. And you know, it is interesting because I might be preaching to the choir, but I think that we can all do better in church. So what are these important lessons? Number one. Your children must be taught discipline early in life. Your children must be taught discipline early in life. The utter disrespect and disregard for their father 
when he spoke with them is quite telling. Where, when Eli, when Eli spoke to his sons, and the fact that they didn't even budge, not even an acknowledgement, it's quite telling. The Bible confirms that Eli failed to restrain his children. If he had been doing so from they were little, then they would have been living that out when they are older because they are in the priesthood. Now, Proverbs 29 verse 15 says, A rod and a reprimand impart wisdom, but a child left undisciplined disgraces its mother. Fathers, mothers, if you do not discipline your children when they are young, you're going to live to regret it. Verse 17 in Proverbs 29 says, Discipline your children and they will give you peace. They will bring you the delights you desire. Discipline your children and they will give you peace. And, you know, I hope I don't... Let, let me just underscore that disciplining children, it must be wholesome. When we discipline children, it must build them up, not tear them down. When we discipline children, they must not, at the end of the day, feel less than themselves. And it must not cut to the very core of their self-esteem. We're talking about good, godly discipline now. We must discipline in a way that at the end of the day, the children, they're still convinced that yes, daddy loves me or yes, mommy loves me. So we must get it together. Get the house in order. So now that's the first lesson. That uh, your children must be taught discipline early in life. Secondly, disobedience must never be overlooked. Disobedience must never be overlooked. In an article written by Chin Chin in 2018, this is what the author said. Part of discipline or ch disciplining our children is the willingness to let them experience a reasonable amount of pain or inconvenience when they behave irresponsibly. If we fail to do this, we will be in deeper heartaches in the future. Dr. James Dobson puts this principle into better words when he said in his book, Parenting Isn't for Cowards, quote, if the strong-willed child is allowed by indulgence to develop habits of defiance and disrespect during his early childhood, those characteristics will haunt him and his parents for the next 20 years. It is important to discipline your children early in their lives and disobedience must never be overlooked. Thirdly, teach children to obey God by teaching them to obey you, the parents. Teach children to obey God by teaching them to obey you, the parents. James Dobson, again, in his book, The Strong-Willed Child, he says, quote, While yielding to the loving leadership of their parents, children are also learning to yield to the benevolent leadership of God himself, end quote. Church, did you know that parents are the first authority figure that children encounter in their lives? If they will not learn to show respect and obedience towards you, the parents, it is going to be more difficult for them to respect and obey authority figures outside of the home, including in school and the community and ultimately God. Why do you think we have so many children who have no regard whatsoever for God? 
And we see people now showing more and more disrespect for church, coming into church and murdering people, robbing church, whole of people, all kind of things going on in church now. That never used to happen. No regard for church. No regard for authority. The teacher, the policeman, none of it makes any sense if there is no respect and regard from in the home. Um, it was a few years ago, there was a young, young man who I decided to mentor. When I was working at the Ministry of Education, he walked onto the compound. Uh, I think at the time he may have been 12 or 13. But he walked onto the compound. Not, he wasn't in school. And at that age, 12 or 13, he had been expelled five times already. And he came onto the compound going around trying to get education officers. He kept saying, I want to go to school, I want to go to school. But when you have such a bad record, nobody wants to take a chance with you. And at that time, I was in an office by myself. And he came there just because I was the only one who was not treating him badly. He stuck around as much as I never wanted him their own because I, <laughs> I wasn't sure what he was up to. But I decided to be nice because it is important to my Christian witness. So they're talking with him and he kept coming back. And I said, okay, you want to be in school? And I told him where to go and he told me that they pretty much told him to get away. So I took him there myself. To cut a long story short, I asked around, got him into a school, and now I had to put my name on the line to get him into the school when gone in. And I said, boy, boy, I'm in the end this, you know. <laughs> you have to try to behave yourself. And I spoke with the principal, me to the principal and everything. And I said to him, I'm working with this young man. We have had some sessions already. I'm counseling with him. And I really am praying and hoping that you will give him a chance. Just give him another chance. And I said to him, well, if you blow this chance, well, you got another chance. You have to show that you really want this. And he was going on well, doing well for about a year. And then it never lasted more than that. But... What, what did I learn from that experience? And by the way, he is now past school age. I think he's 17, going 18 now. Yes, next month is his birthday. And he managed to work his way and, and get into JDF. So now he is, and he told me about it and, and was excited about getting in there and so on. And says, when he comes out, he's going to make sure that he visits me and so on. God bless him. I hope it works out for him. But one of the things I learned, he had a strained relationship with his mother. And his father was not there. When I met with the mother, the mother is just antagonistic. Antagonistic. So he had absolutely no respect for his mother. And the father was non-existent. And when he wanted to visit the father, the father has a different family. And the, the, the wife of the father doesn't want him around. So he feels like nobody wants him. And, and you know, then eventually his father died and he couldn't get to say goodbye. And the mother is just in the way and, and all of that. And all of this was because of how she chose to take out some of her frustration on one of her children because she had eight of them. All right? And he was the second to last out of the eight. He was the seventh child. And because of the antagonism that would have existed in his own home with his mother who is one of the first authority figures in his life and the father is not there, this young man spent the majority of his years between, say, 9 and 17. Every police in the area know him. Everybody know him. He goes to a school. When he gets into a rage, he gets into a totally disrespectful. 
because the first authority figures in his life did not do a good job of teaching him how to respect authority. So church, this is important. Parents are the first authority figures in the lives of children. And unless we show them how to respect and obey us, it's not a bad word, you know. Unless we show them how to respect and obey us, they will not do the same when they are outside of our home. There are teachers here, any teacher can tell you, the, the nice, respectful, yes, miss, no, sir, children in the classroom are the ones who them parents usually can talk to them. Unless you meet us, sometimes there are some, some oddballs out there, you know, because a, a wayward child might meet you and like you, so them just kind of try to respect you and work with you like that young man with me. Because he told me that I was the nicest person to him. Nobody don't treat him as nice as I did. Although he tried to take advantage of me whole heap of time, you know. But, you know, I, I just be straight with him, be honest with him, and talk to him about life and let him know that he needs to have some ambition and get, you know, so that he can achieve. And don't steal. Don't, I mean, nobody was telling him these things. Stealing is wrong. Don't, don't, you don't need to get in trouble with the law to achieve what you want to achieve in life. Work hard, that kind of thing. So we need more people to understand authority. We are raising a generation that has no regard whatsoever for authority. And it is important if we want them at the end of the day to ultimately respect God. Now, Further to this, James Dobson gives this instruction. He says that there are two distinct messages that must be conveyed to every child during the first four years of life. One, I love you more than you can possibly understand. And two, because I love you, I must teach you to obey me. Those two things. And this is the harmony. This is in harmony with what the Bible says when the Bible says that the Lord disciplines his children. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 and 6, the Bible says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. So discipline is important and teaching them how to obey. And remember, when we're teaching children to obey, you know, we, we, we must persuade them and, and love on them and so on. It must not be like a boot camp. Do I say? And you know, we don't have to behave like that because that is just driving fear. We must talk to the children respectfully because they deserve respect as well, you know. Not because they are little means that we must disrespect them and because they are young, they must obey us. Because they don't must, they have their own little will and will do whatever they so want to do. You know, I learned that very early in my foster parenting. So me did have to wheel and come again. <laughs> because it's not just because me say it. I have to take a different approach so that when I do speak, and let me tell you, this is something I have told parents over the years because I, am, I was a teacher in the classroom. I'm still in the classroom, but at a higher level. And I've always said to teachers and parents, discipline is most effective within the context of relationship. When a mother... And a mother of a newborn baby holds her baby in her arms for the first time. Do you hear her saying, don't jump on the bed, don't jump on the couch now, don't wash your hands before you eat, and giving out all the rules? No, not the first time. She's busy smiling and giving God thanks and kissing and, oh, oh, she look like me, and all kind of things or whatever. Busy building relationship. 
And then as the child grows, if the relationship is strong and healthy and there is a love relationship going on, the child will willingly and gladly obey you. It is within the context of relationship that discipline is most effective. I learned this very, very early, and that is why when I was teaching teenagers, I had very little challenge in the classroom because I was deliberate to build relationship with the students that I have so that when a child blurts out a curse word in my classroom, I don't need to throw a fit. They already know the consequences of things like those. I just give one word and I said, you know what to do. And they just work with the program. And then after the time has passed, they come back and they apologize and they say, okay, we're good to go again because of the relationship that we have. It's not antagonistic. It's not anything, but I set my standards. I communicate my expectations and I live consistent to them. Sometimes parents have too many double standards. This minute you say something, the next minute you don't mean it, and you know that children will test you. And you say you're going to do this and do that, and then you don't. And in their minds, they must say, oh, a joke thing. <laughs> they know what you say. And then your discipline, it loses its effectiveness. So, number one, your children must be taught discipline early in life. Number two, disobedience must never be overlooked. Number three, Teach children to obey God by teaching them to obey you, the parents. And number four, we will reap what we sow. We will reap what we sow. Fathers, mothers, parents, put in the hard work now of curbing your children and then get to bask in the blessings of a well-adjusted, successful, and decent child later on. Put in the work now. There are so many parents who are afraid of a little cringe up face and, and they don't want to do anything. And then there are some fathers who are totally just hands off. When they come on the scene, it's just peer playing and fun. That's all you did for. You know, they're not disciplined. And the poor mother, them, is all, the mothers are always the bad cop, while the fathers, you know, a good cop kind of thing. It must be balanced. But put in the hard work of curbing the children now. They will respect you for it later, and you will be holding your head high later. If you do not do that now, and choose to do the easy thing, if you fail to discipline your children now, then later on you are going to hang your head in shame and wonder. I ask you the question, what are you sowing in the lives of your children now? When we fail to discipline our children according to what is right, we are going to reap what we sow. As in the case of Eli's sons, the result was fatal. Fatal. It is a hard truth, and let me say this. It is a hard truth to accept that there are cases when the children's lives become ruined simply because parents failed to act upon what they knew as the proper discipline of their children. It is important. We have to pay attention to our children and not only do we, not only should we speak the principles that are important for them to live by, but parents must also be examples of those principles to live by. Because at the end of the day, children are going to do what you did and not as you said. By the way, did you know that Samuel had two sons? In 1 Samuel chapter 8, 
I want you to read it, verse 1, 2, and 3. You can write it down. Samuel made the same mistake Eli made. And Samuel's sons were just like Eli's sons. Can you imagine mentoring this young man in the ways of the temple? And Samuel became a wonderful priest and judge in Israel and a poor parent just like Eli. I don't think Eli sat him down and talked to him about any parenting or anything, but that's what he saw. And isn't it interesting that the Bible confirms that children will actually catch what you are doing, how you live your life, and not what you say. So we must live with integrity before them so that when they become adults, they are predisposed to godliness. I want to say that there are instances when parents have done everything that needs to be done. You pray, you fast, you grow them up in a church, you correct them and, and all of that, and still the children fail to do what is right. But this is no excuse to not continue to do what you are supposed to do and to be what you are supposed to be. Because the fact of the matter is, it is better when you stand before the Lord to give account for how you stewarded your children that the Lord gave you. For you to say, yes, I did what I was supposed to do under God. And I was what I was supposed to be under God. And then they still chose to do otherwise. It is better for you to, to, to be in that position than to know that because of your lack of proper parenting, your children suffered. So I want you to know is that uh, what we sow, we will reap. Too many parents, fathers included, nowadays, they are not only condoning the wrongdoings of their children, they're actually defending it. Mothers as well both parents in many cases, and in due time, they are going to reap what they sow. I want to wrap up. The work of parenting is as challenging as every other occupation, but far more emotionally intense. Eli, he gave his troubled children many privileges but little paternal involvement. And it is a fact that even the most dedicated parents may face the heartbreak of wayward children. Rather than laying blame here and there or stereotyping causes, let us just simply note that parenting children is an occupation that requires much prayer, much skill, much community support, good fortune, and love as any other occupation, if not more. And ultimately, to be a parent, whether our children bring us delight or disappointment or a little bit of both, to be a parent is to depend on God, to depend on his grace, to depend on his mercy, and to hope for a redemption beyond what we see during our lifetimes. And perhaps our deepest comfort is to remember that God also experienced a parent's heartbreak for his condemned son, yet overcame all through the power of love. I want to leave these questions with you, fathers. And I'm going to leave these questions with you, mothers, as well. The first question is this. What can you do to be a better father to your children? And if your children are old enough, why not ask them that question and hear what they say? What can you do to be a better father to your children? Number two, how deliberate have you been to discipline, train, guide, and counsel your sons and your daughters. How deliberate have you been to train, 
to discipline, to guide, and to counsel your sons and daughters. The third question is this. Do you know where your children are right now? If they are not in church with you, do you know if they're in any church at all? Or are they otherwise minded? Do you know where your children are? Number four, when you consider the lives of your children, what they are now pursuing and how they are living, are you comfortable? What role did you play in this? Are you comfortable when you consider the lives of your children? Number five, in what areas are you prepared to make a commitment to depend on God to help you to be a wholesome parent? In what areas are you prepared to depend on God? Make a commitment to depend on God to help you to be a wholesome parent. You know, the Bible speaks about the fact that while God can mediate between Eli's sons and the people that they sin against, there is no one to mediate the sins that the sons have committed directly against God. Because when we sin directly against God, there is no intercession that is possible, only condemnation. And the people in, in this text, they needed someone to intercede between them and God. When the Bible says that God planned to kill them, it's, it's an indication of their persistent rejection and refusal to repent that God had given them over to judgment. That was their judgment because of their consistency in re rejecting the Lord. So Eli was culpable for the impoverished priesthood at Shiloh. And he is also held responsible for his son's actions because he honored his sons more than God by neglecting to discipline them. God chose to judge the house of Eli swiftly and surely and the judgment was long-lasting. Long well, the final question is this. When was the last time you prayed for your son. When was the last time you prayed for your daughter? Fathers, I want you to know that your son is very likely to become the father that you are to him right now. And fathers, I want you to know that your daughter is very likely to get involved with a man who is like her father in many respects. If this reality were to be borne out, would it bring you joy or would it warrant your disapproval? Fathers, today I charge you to step up, man up, and get your house in order.